Welcome to the AI and Big Data Finance webinar. Uh, we're, we're delighted to have uh, two distinguished speakers today. Uh, Serhi Kozak from the University of Maryland will present his paper, When Do Cross-Sectional Asset Pricing Factors Span the Stochastic Discount Factor? And uh, Kerry Back from Rice uh, will be the discussant. Um, Serhi will have 30 minutes for the presentation. And then after 15 minutes or so, um, I'll, I'll briefly interrupt him so that we can uh, have some questions uh, from the audience. And then after that, uh, Kerry will, will do his discussion for 20 minutes, and then we'll open up the floor for questions from, from the audience. So if you're in the audience, uh, please submit your questions in the Q&A, and I will then call on you during the questioning part. And please be respectful and mindful with your comments. Uh, the presentation will be recorded and will be posted with the slides on our website afterwards. And after the main part of the webinar, we'll have an unrecorded discussion uh, in, in which everyone in the audience will be upgraded uh, to, to be a panelist. So um, I think those are all the announcements I want to make. And uh, I don't want to take more of your time, Serhi, so please take it away. All right. Well, uh, thank you, Andy. Um, can you see my slides? Everything's good, right? I'm assuming. Okay. Uh, so this is a, a joint work with uh, Stefan Nagel. Um, in this paper, we are trying to develop a framework and a toolkit to uh, think about several strands of cross-sectional asset pricing literature um, in a sort of unified way. Um, so... Um, so let me start with a notation. Um, it's cross-sectional asset pricing. So we've worked with characteristics. Uh, so let's take these characteristics. Let's put it into this matrix X. So X will have N rows, so N stocks and J characteristics. Let's say the first characteristic is a vector of ones. And then you have like things like size, book to market, momentum, and many more. Okay, so we'll denote X's returns with this letter Z. So there will be N stocks. So that's a vector of um, N elements. Um, and so cross-sectional asset pricing links expected returns on stocks to these characteristics. And to summarize this relationship in a reduced form uh, model, we typically model uh, the stochastic discount factor as a function of a smaller number of factors. And the way we construct these factors is we um, just basically use, a, uh, like we construct them as a function of characteristics X and uh, these returns Z. Okay, there are many ways we can in practice construct the factors. So we could use uh, like standard form of French approach, for example. So we could just create these sorted portfolios. We could do univariate factors. That's something that we used in our previous papers. Basically, we just use characteristics as portfolio weights. So these are these X prime Z factors. Um, or we can implement the factors by running something like cross sectional regressions, right? So at any time T, if you regress returns onto the uh, uh, characteristics, and if you look at the slope coefficients, well, these slope coefficients could be interpreted as portfolios or the factors, and you could see that they're, they're basically given as a rotation of univariate factors with this uh, rotational matrix factor X prime X inverse. Uh, no matter which method you use, the objective of these methods is to essentially create a reduced form factor model uh, and allow you to spend the mean variance of, uh, frontier. But generally, to spend the mean variance frontier, we need to have this information about both all the means of assets conditionally and the full covariance matrix of all stock returns, right? So when we take stocks and we, when we put them into portfolios, we essentially disregarding that information about the covariance matrix of stock returns. So we ask three questions in this paper. The first question that we ask is, what are the necessary and sufficient conditions for these uh, factor models to still yield uh, uh, the, uh, the essentially uh, to still allow you to achieve that mean variance efficiency. So in other words, let's say I start with a big cross section. I have 10,000 of stocks. If I put these stocks into a smaller number of portfolios, let's say 10 portfolios, when do mean variance efficient portfolios formed from the stocks versus formed from the factors are the same? So when do we not lose information by taking this very large cross section of stocks and um, rotating it essentially into this uh, much smaller uh, cross-section of the factors. So that's the first question. In general, you probably would guess that um, we would lose some efficiency when we do that. 
or there must be some rigid conditions that have to be satisfied for this to work. So this has been recognized a bit in the literature. So um, people realize that the factors that we usually work with, we call them heuristic factors, um, they are imperfect. And one of the manifestations of this is that they are contaminated with unpriced risk. So intuitively, they just not fully diversified because there could be some systematic unpriced factors that we cannot remove by because we, we don't use that entire covariance matrix of stock returns. There are attempts to alleviate this. So the notable paper, a notable paper that does that is this paper, a paper by Daniel uh, Mata uh, Rodke Santos, uh, 2020. And they basically introduce this hedging approach. So the second question we ask in this paper is, um, how do we think about this hedging approach within this framework? And what are the sufficient conditions for this hedging approach to actually work? And the last question we ask in the paper is related to this large recent literature of dimensionality reduction methods. So the idea of this literature is that, well, maybe we have too many characteristics, too many factors, right? So instead of like putting 100 factors, maybe we want to have a model with a smaller number of latent statistical factors. The examples of these papers are like, for example, our paper shrinking the cross section or Kelly Prout uh, Sue paper on instrumental PCA or projected PCA paper by Kim Karajic Nuriel and, uh, and, and a few others. Um, so the third question we ask in this paper is again, like how do we think about these methods within this framework? And what are the necessary and sufficient conditions for dimensionality reduction to be possible and still yield that mean variance efficiency? So that's roughly what we'll discuss in this paper. Um, and um, this is a short outline. So basically, I'll try to talk about the conditions, the heuristic factors, factor hedging. Um, then I'll talk just very briefly about dimensionality reduction. I'll show you some new empirical results that we have. So let's start with the setup. So X, remember, are our characteristics. So we're going to measure conditional moments. I'll denote them sigma, sigma T as the conditional covariance matrix. Uh, of returns conditional on the information set where you include these characteristics xt. And mu would be the, major, uh, the vector of uh, mean returns, again, conditional on, on these x. Now, the fact that we are conditioning on this information set is really important because in the sense what we are saying is that, well, we observe only these characteristics. So we within this information set, we'll, we're going to study how to get to the mean variance efficient portfolio. Now, of course, if you're missing some characteristics and if you can get a better mean variance efficient portfolio by including these characteristics because they tell you something about the means that we don't have, then that would be a totally different thing. But this paper is not about these type of omitted factors. It's about getting mean variance efficiency within the context of information that you have. So conditional on this XT. All right. So, um, so let's say that this is our input. Um, let's say we wanted to form the MVA portfolio just from individual stocks. And let's simplify. Let's assume we observe sigma T and mu T. Okay. Well, in this case, it's very easy. You can just form a standard hansen Jagannathan SDF. We know how to compute this coefficient B. Um, it will be given by sigma inverse mu, which is basically just mark of its portfolio weights. And that's it. Basically, you get MVA portfolio and we are basically done. Uh, the only problem is that we don't observe these sigma t and mu t, right? And those are actually very difficult moments to estimate. So we really have to estimate like every month, what is the full variance covariance matrix of let's say like 10,000 by 10,000 stocks and then to have the full conditional means. And that's something that we typically don't observe, right? So what we do instead is um, in asset pricing, we typically simplify and we say, well, let's work with factors. Right, so the way I will um, operational, uh, operationalize this, I will just use this um, matrix W that converts stocks into factors. So it takes N stocks and puts them into J portfolios. Okay, so that's how we just will be, uh, denote the factors. And let's now use factors as an input, right? So we can compute means on the factors, we can compute covariances of the factors, and then we can construct the uh, SDF or the MV portfolio using the factors. Okay, so that first question that I mentioned that we look at in the paper is we ask, when is this SDF constructed from the factors the same as the, as the SDF or the MVU portfolio constructed from the original stock returns? Okay, so the necessary condition for this to work and sufficient condition for, uh, for this to work is that the maximum square short ratio from the first SDF is equal to the maximum square short ratio of the second SDF, right? So that would be that condition one in this lemma. On the left, you have the squared short ratio from individual stocks, mu prime sigma inverse mu, 
And this one is the maximum square sharp ratio from the factors. Okay, so we want these two to be equal. So what this lemma tells you that they will be equal if and only if this condition number two is satisfied. Okay, and this condition number two, basically intuitively, it links means to the covariance matrix, these weights W and some vector of constants of BT, okay? So it sort of tells us potentially, potentially we could use that information, how to construct the factors because W is something that governs how the factors are constructed. So it tells us how to construct the factors potentially that so that one is satisfied. Now, an easy way to interpret this condition is to realize that this sigma W is really, um, oops, uh, is really just the covariance of stock returns with the factors. So then this condition is very intuitive. It just says that mean returns should be proportional to covariances. And that's just the very usual like asset pricing thing that we look at, right? Means proportional to covariances or means proportional to betas. That's when we don't get alphas, we get mean variance efficiency. So there is nothing like very deep in this condition. We all know this condition. It comes from basic asset pricing. But for us, it's a useful starting point because it's basically a sufficient and necessary condition uh, for the factors models to work. So now we will add another assumption on top of it. And with this condition and that assumption, we'll actually derive interesting results. So this is the assumption. So the first thing we assume is that mean returns are linear. So mean returns in individual stocks are linear in characteristics of these stocks. Now, we don't really think of this as a very restrictive assumption because, for example, if you're worried about nonlinearities, um, well, we don't have to take a stand on X. You can always, if you're worried about like squares of like some characteristic, well, you can just expand X and put it inside of X, okay? So in that sense, we could make this X like a very large X and include those nonlinearities and theoretically we would still be, uh, will be fine. Obviously, like it's only when you take a stand on what goes into X, then you can say like, oh, maybe I didn't include something, but uh, we can always fix that by expanding X. So with this assumption, the first result that we show is that there is actually an optimal way to construct the factors, right? So we call them GLS factors, but really these are the factors that, so ignore this S, it's just a rotation matrix, could be an identity matrix. But uh, the, the, the second part of these factors is using this characteristics X, and then the matrix, the, the variance covariance matrix of stock sigma inverse, and then you multiply by, by Z. So they're almost like univariate factors, but you have the sigma inverse in between. Right? That's something that we don't typically include in heuristic factors. So basically what this proposition tells you that if you construct factors in this specific way, then you're guaranteed to get mean variance efficiency. Okay, so you basically will be getting the same MVU portfolio as from the individual stocks. Now, how do you in practice construct these factors? Well, an easy way is to run a cross-sectional GLS regression. So similar to cross-sectional OLS regressions, take returns, regress on characteristics, use uh, that covariance matrix sigma uh, as a GLS weighting matrix, and this would give you the factors. You can see that these are the same factors with S just given by this bracket inverse. Now, the nice thing about these factors is that betas actually line up with characteristics, so betas would be equal to X. And this sort of underlines one important aspect of this uh, proposition is that it's sort of like for us a, a reminder that there is no real economic difference between direct linear predictions of returns by X and factor pricing model with the factors constructed based on X. So in other words, if you tell me that there are some characteristics that predict returns, I can tell you that there always must exist an asset pricing model with the factors constructed as I showed before for which risk exposures, betas, would be exactly explaining all expected returns. Right, so in this sense, there is really no distinction between risk-based and behavioral explanations uh, of asset pricing models because there is this mathematical equivalence. If characteristics predict returns, there always exist an asset pricing models where betas will exactly line up with the returns. Okay, it's only when you misspecify the factors. So let's say I use some exogenous factors like from a French factors that are not efficient. Then I be I can be in the scenario when characteristics predict returns better than let's say betas with respect to these misspecified factors. But for us, like in this context, it just means that the factors are misspecified. All right, so uh, so this is all good, but the question remains: like, okay, so we have these efficient factors, but how do we construct them in practice? So if you look at these factors, the the issue really is that the sigma inverse matrix here 
is something that we typically don't see, right? It's the matrix of all covariances, pairwise covariances of all stocks. It's a massive matrix, potentially like 10,000 by 10,000 measured at every month. Okay, so that makes computing these factors potentially impractical, right? So what, what do we do instead typically? We typically ignore that covariance matrix. We just construct simple heuristic factors that are just X prime Z, right? That's what we typically do in asset pricing. Well, this proposition too is basically our main result in this paper. And it says that these heuristic factors can still be mean variance efficient if and only if a specific condition about that covariance matrix is satisfied. And the condition is basically given by these two lines, but I'll just give you a little bit of intuition. It basically says that there is a separation between risks in that covariance matrix into two parts. And this first part, the covariances with the factors, uh, the, the exposures are driven by your characteristics X, but the exposures to other factors that you miss, um, they essentially have to have these exposures that are orthogonal to X. Now it's easy to a little bit easier to see this in the context of a factor model. So basically I use the slide to rewrite this um, equation in terms of a factor model like here. And uh, you can basically think of it like these are stock returns Z. There are factors F that I observed. There are betas with respect to these factors. These betas are given by my characteristics X. But then there are some factors G's that are potentially unpriced. I don't see them. I miss them. Um, and they have these betas. So when, when do I get mean variance efficiency? Well, it's only if I include these factors G's within my factors or if the betas with respect to these factors G actually end up being orthogonal to the betas with respect to the factors that I observe. Because if they are correlated, then I would basically have issues and the issues would manifest on me effectively um, unintentionally loading on these unpriced factors G, and they will essentially blow up my variance as my, uh, of, of my MVU portfolio, and I'll, I'll, I'll lose efficiency because my portfolio will not be fully diversified. So that's that's really the idea. Okay, Sergey, maybe this is a, a good time to sort of briefly pause for questions from the audience, if there are any. So are there any clarifying questions or something as we go along? Okay. Well, I guess. All right, so, so I'll continue. Um, Go on. So let's think for a second. When is this condition? When is this condition more likely to be satisfied? So I'll just rewrite the condition. You can see that there are these two pieces, and we want this second piece to be effectively this U to be orthogonal to X, or at least quantitatively, we want this U to be like the second piece to be small. So if you think about this. If you include a lot of things in X, so if you have a lot of characteristics, a lot of factors, then quantitatively, this first piece becomes more and more important than the second piece, right? So that sort of like gives us first intuition that working with factor models that include a lot of characteristics, a lot of factors will likely make them um, more efficient because this condition would be more likely to be satisfied quantitatively in practice, okay? So again, working with models that include 50 factors is probably better than working with a three factor models. Okay. And the second thing that I want to emphasize, I already mentioned it, but indirectly, is that there is really nothing specific about factors that earn risk premium in this framework. It's about spending this covariance matrix. So even if you have factors that don't earn any risk premium, so they're unpriced, including them is still helpful because they will allow you to satisfy this condition better. So if you think about industry, so if you think about other unpriced factors, you actually want to include them to get to that MV efficiency, even if there is zero compensation in terms of risk premium, okay? So, so this is all good, but let's say we don't see these unobserved factors. We can't include them. And let's say we can't estimate that sigma inverse matrix. Can we do something about it? Well, turns out, yes. Turns out that if we can't estimate that sigma, we could still engage in these hedging approaches that effectively will be sort of like almost indirectly trying to estimate important dimensions of that sigma matrix so that you can remove these unpriced risks. So these hedging approaches basically try to uh, back out the, the, these 
factors that we missed that drive covariances just from the covariance matrix of individual stocks or the factors themselves. Okay, and uh, this is the approach uh, in that DMRS paper. Uh, we kind of, we, we slightly modified it, but I'll just give you some intuition. The way it works is that we take our original heuristic factors that we usually work with, um, and then the next step, we compute covariances of individual stock returns with these factors. Then we residualize these covariances with respect to X, and what it does is that we, it essentially isolates unpriced risk exposures. So we can now use these isolated risk exposures as weights to create what we call hedging factors. These would be essentially the factors that uh, are purely unpriced risk factors. Okay, and now that we have these purely unpriced factors, we can essentially use them to remove these unpriced risk from the original factors. So the way we can do it, if we can compute the covariances with respect to these hedging factors and then orthogonalize the original weights with respect to these covariances. And this will sort of give us these hedged factors that are stripped down of that additional risk that they were inheriting by incidentally by loading on these unpriced factors, right? So it will allow us to keep our risk premium, but essentially reduce variance and deliver better mean variance efficiency. So that's really the idea behind how these methods work. We have sufficient conditions for these methods in the paper. I don't have the time to discuss that. But uh, what I do want to say is that um, you can actually implement this procedure several times. You can iterate it several times. And the reason that works is because every time you do it, you essentially have to recompute the covariances of stock returns with these newly hedged factors. And effectively, you're, using new, you're basically using more information by doing that. So that's why you can do it several times, and you can remove more and more unpriced sources of risk and improve your efficiency. And ultimately, it's an empirical question to see how much you can do that. So we'll, we'll try to do that. Okay, so the last theoretical question that we explore in this paper is related to this dimensionality reduction literature. Remember, the idea here was that um, maybe we're in the context of this like zoo of factors, so we have too many of them, and we want to have a statistical model that just uses a smaller number, right? So the way we think about this is that we use this matrix Q that essentially translates X characteristics with X could be, let's say, 100 characteristics into maybe like 10, um, 10 factors, okay? And we put this Q in that assumption one for means, and we put it into that covariance assumption. And we basically show in the paper that you can uh, identify this Q by implementing a simple PCA for some specific portfolios. And the type of portfolios you would use depend on the normalization that you use for Q. So if you use this normalization, that is just a Q prime Q as an identity matrix, then we show in the paper that if you implement PCA uh, on the OLS portfolios, you basically recover uh, Kelly-Pritt two factors. Uh, if you implement a PCA on uh, orthonormal uh, on the portfolios formed with these orthonormalized characteristics, and that corresponds to this normalization, then you re recover uh, something that is very close to Kim Krajcik and Uriel uh, type factors. So basically, the point of this section is that we show that all these approaches that people use in the literature that seemingly are slightly different or more than slightly different, uh, we could. Uh, uh, think about in the same framework and in the end with the same framework they almost are doing the same thing they're doing pca just on slightly different portfolios and that could of course drive differences in the empirical results but it's uh, um it, it's still a very similar procedure in in this context okay so in the remaining um minutes that i have um i want to talk a little bit about the empirics so the main goal of our empirics is to, <clears throat> to look at heuristic factors and ask the question, well, we know they're inefficient, but empirically, how inefficient actually are they, right? To answer that question, we need to get somehow to the efficient factor, so the efficient MVE portfolio, so the MVE portfolio. Uh, we don't really see it, right? So what we do, what we'll do instead is two things. So first thing would be, a very simple naive estimator of that sigma co uh, covariance matrix so that we could implement GLS factors, right? So um, we'll have to make a lot of assumptions about this. Um, the way we would estimate it, we'll just use rolling data, three-year rolling data, compute the full covariance matrix of individual stock returns and approximate it by PCA with, let's say, 30, 50, or 100 factors. And that would be just the model for that covariance matrix. 
The second approach is to um, implement this hedging approach. Uh, the idea would be that if you take out heuristic factors, if you hedge them several times, and if you see a lot of statistical improvement in the efficiency, so let's say maximum square sharp ratio, well, then it means that the original factors were not efficient in the first place, right? So that would be our benchmark of how efficient were the original factors. Okay, so we'll try these two, uh, and I'll just show you the results. So the data that we use is the data we used in the previous papers, 34 characteristics, no microstocks, and like this is the sample. This first plot shows us the average square sharp ratio improvement in percent relative to the model that uses original factors. So this the baseline is this line at the bottom at zero. That's just like using heuristic factors. And then on the x-axis, you basically, we consider different models with, let's say, three factors, four factors, five factors, and so on and so forth. And in reality, if you look at the <clears throat> average three-factor model by, let's say, like randomly drawing three factors from the set of all factors. Okay, and then we compute uh, squared sharp ratio, and then we look at the improvements, and then we take the average of those. So the blue line shows us that if you look at the average three-factor model, if you hedge the original factors just one time, you already see a massive 50% improvement in squared sharp ratio. If you hedge it uh, two more times, you get to about 60%, and there is little improvement beyond that. The red line shows you the GLS estimator. It's basically like that other approach that we use to estimate that, that covariance matrix non-parametrically and like in a very um, rough um, manner. Uh, but you could see that it's actually quite similar to these results. And that's, that's very nice because in the end, what hedging does, it's sort of like an alternative way of estimating that covariance matrix without actually estimating the covariance matrix. So you can see that the results are quite similar. You can see that if you estimate the covariance matrix using um, our assumptions, you get very similar results than uh, compared to when you implement hedging several times, right? Another finding that we see here is that, um, well, uh, hedging does help, and multiple rounds of hedging helps, so you go from here to here. Uh, but you can see that the uh, benefits of hedging decay as the number of factors increase. Um, so remember, again, this is expected. I discussed this that if you include more characteristics, then we are more likely to satisfy that covariance condition. And that's exactly what we see here. Okay, so, uh, so that's another interesting uh, finding that I think uh, is useful. And lastly, the improvement is bad, right? So we'll also, I'll show you statistical significance of some of this and you'll see that uh, the improvement is statistically significant. This is the same picture in absolute level. You can see a big improvement in the square sharp ratio. Um, These are the tables that um, look at individual models where we can actually run statistical tests. So basically for each row, we just estimate a one factor model, well, really a two factor model that includes this factor and a constant. So kind of like the market, okay? So you can see if you just look at the MV portfolio based on these two factors, it's 0 0.4 using the original factors. But if you hedge them, you get to 0 0.7, and if you hedge a little bit more, you get like about the same level. If you do a GLS, and I'll just focus on this PCA column, that's the one I explained, you get to 0 0.8. The bottom row shows you basically the average across all these anomalies. Well, actually more in the paper. This is just a select set of the anomalies, but you have more in the paper. You can see that the average square sharp ratio for the average anomaly is 0 0.9. With hedging, you get to 1.4. With GLS, you get to 1.6. And stars indicate statistical significance. We use this uh, uh, Berea's uh, Schenken uh, test, and uh, we see that two stars indicate a 1% uh, p-value, so 1% statistical significance. We can also do this for a model that includes all the factors. Our expectation is that with all the factors, because you already have so many characteristics, so many factors, hedging is probably won't help much. That's what we see typically. So if you look at fa or less factors or these orthonormalized SVD, we call them SVD, but these are just orthonormalized factors. You can see that um, if you hedge, so these are unhedged sharp ratios. If you hedge them, you, you see some slight improvements in sharp ratios, but by little. Um, actually, univariate factors seem to be a little bit less efficient. So you see bigger improvements in square sharp ratio. But what's also interesting that if I construct a GLS factors and if I try to hedge them, well, remember hedging shouldn't help in this case, right? Because if they're already efficient factors, then hedging shouldn't help. And that's exactly what we see. So hedging GLS factors 
just doesn't help. And there is only like sampling variation estimation error that you see. And uh, all of this basically carries out to out of sample. Um, the last thing I'm going to mention, we also look at dimensionality reduction in the paper. It's the results that we are working on right now, and there are still things to do. Uh, two conclusions here is we implement a lot of different models, like shrinking the cross-section, IPPC, IPCA, PPCA. Um, we see evidence similar in the papers. Um, generally, models that do this IPCA type of rotation, uh, they tend to give higher sharp ratios. We also tried hedging these models. Um, we expect it not to have a lot of benefit because they already maximize the variance by construction. Uh, but what we saw is that, again, the univariate factors, there is benefit of hedging. IPCA type of factors, less benefit, but some if you do GLS. Um, for PPCA factors, we also saw some benefit. But if you do GLS type of factors, then again, there is no benefit. Okay, I think I'm running out of time, so I'll just conclude. Um, so basically, we discussed three things in the paper. Um, we talk about the equivalency between constructing the immune portfolio from individual stocks versus the factors. We show sufficient and necessary conditions. We talk about hedging. We talk again about we talk about sufficient conditions, and then we uh, discuss factor reduction, uh, dimensionality reduction, and we show necessary and sufficient conditions. Um, in general, um, because we cannot really construct GLS factors, we usually work with heuristic factors. So we don't know that sigma t, so we just use these. We show in the paper exactly what the conditions are for these factor, uh, factors to be mean variance sufficient. And we also argue that these conditions are more likely to be satisfied when you have a lot of characteristics, so a lot of factors. Uh, we also argue that you need to include uh, factors that are even on price because they really help in this context. Finally, uh, from the dimensionality reduction perspective, we uh, talk about uh, these joint conditions on sigma and uh, uh, and mu, so the means and covariances that make these methods work, and we show that all these methods are closely linked, so they could all be thought as PCA on simple characteristic sorted factors. Um, all right, so um, I'll stop here, and uh, I'm looking forward to the discussion. And, well, thank you so much uh, for this wonderful talk, Serhi, and uh, Harry Back from Rice University is uh, going to be discussing the paper now. Thanks, Andy. Uh, I apologize to Andy and Marcus for having to uh, uh, try to find me this morning. Uh, Andy was creative and uh, contacted my colleague, Kevin, who came down the hall and knocked on my door and said, yeah, Carrie, I think you're supposed to be on a webinar. I had this on my calendar for tomorrow, unfortunately. But, um, I, I did catch most of Sarah Hayes' talk and uh, read the paper, and I'll, um, I'll give some comments. So actually, I don't have a whole lot of useful uh, advice for Sergey and uh, Stefan. Um, I'll explain sort of how I understand the results, and, and maybe that'll be useful. I'll have a couple of small comments at the end. So let, let me share my screen. I was reading my discussion, sorry. Let me back up. Okay, let's start from there. Um, so the, the basic setup is, you know, we want to find um, sigma inverse mu, um, old problem. We want to find uh, portfolios that span the frontier or equivalently uh, span an SDF. Um, so the, the key assumption in the paper is that risk premium are linear in characteristics. So the, the risk premium are, um, linear combinations of the columns of the X matrix. And so, of course, under this condition, we need to find sigma inverse X V. And so what the paper uh, studies is how to find sigma inverse X. So the, the, the first proposition, I'll sort of explain the, the derivation. It's, it's straightforward. Um, so, you know, given any M, we can obviously write sigma inverse X V in this form. And let's take uh, let's take m inverse v and call that uh, vector of prices of risk, and let's take sigma inverse x m and call it uh, uh, matrix w. And so we've got uh, that sigma inverse mu is w b. Um, and so we found the uh, mean variance frontier uh, as long as w takes this form. Uh, under the assumption, of course, that risk premium are linear in characteristics. So we, we want to um, 
look now at some different uh, possible approaches to finding factors and ask uh, when they can be written in this form, when the um, uh, matrix of uh, transformed characteristics um, spans the, um, uh, when it can be written in this form. So, so let's start with OLS and factors like that. So here's kind of the main question of the paper, I think, is that if we, um, if we uh, take post multiply the matrix of characteristics by some J by J matrix X, for example, X transpose X inverse, mm -hmm. which would be the OLS factors, when is that equal to sigma inverse XM for some N? So when can we solve that for M? When we can, then we know that um, XS um, spans the frontier. So in this circumstance, sigma inverse mu would be a linear combination of the columns of XS. And so an equivalent question, obviously, you can post multiply by S inverse and equivalent and, and by sigma, pre-multiply by sigma, an equivalent question is when sigma X uh, equals XL for some matrix L. So when can you solve that equation, which is, um, uh, which when it's true, it is a statement that covariances are spanned by characteristics. And the leading example that they look at are the OLS factors. So as Sarah mentioned, of course, each column of um, sigma X is a vector of covariances. And each column of XL is obviously a linear combination of the characteristics X. And so we're asking, when are covariances with the X portfolios spanned by the X characteristics? And the main result of the paper, as Sarah said, is proposition two. Um, is clearly a sufficient condition for the covariances to be spanned by the characteristics when the covariance matrix factors in this form with U transpose X equals zero, just multiply it out. And you'll see that that's a sufficient condition for what we want for spanning of the covariances by characteristics. And it's also necessary, well, that's the content of proposition two, is that this decomposition of the covariance matrix implies that covariances with the X portfolios are spanned by the characteristics X. Now, this is a, you know, a nice looking result. Um, it seems that the main thing that we get from it is that it's probably more likely to be true when X is large, uh, which, uh, you know, sort of, it would anticipate that when we've got more characteristics, we're more likely to be able to span the frontier. Um, it seems that it might be possible to get some more from this. That would be very interesting, I think, if, if you could do that. And so to have a decomposition of the covariance matrix in that form, it's, it's clearly sufficient that um, the excess returns have this factor structure where the um, U loadings and the X loadings on the factors are orthogonal. So that's the um, you know, restrictive condition. We can always do, the, uh, we can always write a factor model for orthogonal factors, but the restriction is that the um, loadings on um, some of the factors are orthogonal to the uh, portfolios that we're interested in. That, formed by the X characteristics. All right, so the rest of the paper is an application and extension of this result, um, starting with uh, when hedging OLS factors works. Um, so um, my, proposition three can be described, I think, in this form. Suppose there's some matrix. This is not quite as general as the proposition in the paper, but I think this is how the proposition in the paper is applied. So suppose there's some matrix uh, A uh, such that we have the same decomposition of the covariance matrix, but instead of U being orthogonal to X, U is orthogonal to AX. So we're going to apply some transformation to the characteristics, um, and we, um, we're going to perhaps weaken the restriction that U be orthogonal to X by uh, in requiring instead that it be orthogonal to this transformed AX. Um, and suppose also that we can uh, factor U uh, U omega U, U transpose in this form with some um, N by J matrix V where the E's are orthogonal to X as before, um, but um, 
and these are orthogonal to V. Uh, but what we're not requiring now, uh, what, what we're not requiring is that, um, uh, is that um, V be orthogonal to X. So V is gonna be orthogonal to AX, but not necessarily to X. And we ask the same question now, except instead of asking it for excess, we ask it for AXS. When is it written of this form? And when that's true, then uh, the mean variance frontier is spanned by this transform matrix of characteristics. It's, it's spanned by AXS. And as I mentioned, we don't require in this case that uh, X be orthogonal to U, but we do need um, these extra columns, these columns be that, uh, perhaps are not orthogonal to X, we need them to be orthogonal to AX. Um, which you can get, and this is, um, you know, um, inside of the paper, you can get by taking A to be the residual maker with respect to V. Um, you can uh, transform by taking the residual of the projection of X on V. Of course, you're going to get columns that are orthogonal to V. So we can always transform X to make it orthogonal to V. Um, and then, this is um, this is a uh, significant result is, is that suppose we write um, this matrix V hat, um, which, um, so we, we don't need to know, we don't have to put our hands on V directly. We can write this matrix V hat and under the assumptions of the proposition that's V times a non-singular matrix. And so instead of regressing on V, which we may not know, we can regress on this matrix that we can construct from the um, covariance matrix and the characteristics and whatever transformation S we want to use, we can construct this and project the columns of X on, on these uh, columns and take the residual from that and it, it'll be orthogonal to V. And um, this uh, interpretation is uh, that it follows uh, in the spirit of Daniel et al that we're extracting components of uh, X that are uncorrelated with the unpriced part of X. So um, we're taking parts of X that are uncorrelated with V hat. Um, and V hat is the um, matrix of covariances of this residual. Uh, and th this residual is from um, projecting covariances sigma x on x. So project covariances on x, take the residual, take covariances. This, this is a little bit um, uh, mind bending for me. This is a, uh, uh, something that wasn't trivial to wrap my mind around. So we're gonna take covariances, um, uh, and then um, project them on X and take the um, residual and compute covariances with the residual and then project X on that residual and take its residual. And that will be the uh, hedging. Uh, and, and it's much easier to just think of it as, you know, you're extracting the components of X that are uncorrelated with the unpriced part. And it's the unpriced part because we've projected the covariances and taking the residual. So that's pretty cool, I think. Uh, that's a nice, um, I mean, in general, I think the paper is a nice, um, provides a nice foundation for understanding a variety of things. And this is a pretty cool, uh, pretty cool result. So proposition four is if you need to assume that there are more than uh, J columns, in this decomposition of the covariance matrix that are um, correlated with X, then you can do iterative projections. Um, and then the last part of the paper is about dimensionality reduction. Um, so here we're going to take a, a smaller set of factors by um, uh, taking linear combinations of the X characteristics, some set of linear combinations, uh, K, some and uh, assume that as, if you make the same assumptions about decomposing the covariance matrix in terms of Y instead of X, um, then proposition two applies. 
And so the mean variance frontier is spanned by YS. Um, now we need to find Q. Um, and the first approach to this is um, to, uh, to note that the covariance matrix of the OLS factors is Q lambda, uh, Q transpose. That's just from um, this decomposition um, and assuming that um, U and X were orthogonal. Uh, and now if you make the assumption that Q is idempotent and lambda is diagonal, then, then you have the eigen decomposition. And so you can start with the eigen decomposition and um, use that to find Q. And then we get the um, Kelly Pruitt uh, Sue uh, instrument and principal components. Um, and then the, uh, they also applied it to the PPCA, but I was uh, just thinking about that when uh, I got uh, Kevin's knock on my door saying it's time to uh, come into the webinar. Uh, so I just had a couple of very small comments. Now, so obviously linearity of risk premium characteristics is a restricted condition. Um, I mean, it's not, there, it's not restrictive in theory because we could always take nonlinear functions and use those as the characteristics. So we end up with a linear function of the transformed characteristics. But if we're gonna use our usual characteristics, um, we know that it's restrictive that um, things like random forests and neural networks that uh, are nonlinear functions that include interactions of the characteristics do better at predicting returns in and out of sample than linear models. Um, so that, that's, that's one obvious point. Um, the other point that's maybe more constructive is that um, the, this restrictive assumption is not used very much in the paper. Um, so the papers about when the covariances are spanned by characteristics or um, the transformations of the characteristics um, or reductions of the characteristics, um, which have nothing to do about risk premium being linear and characteristic. So the paper, the, technically the paper is about covariance matrices. And the, the only way, the only reason that risk premium come in is that the, the uh, analysis of the covariance matrix is interesting because under the assumption that risk premium are linear, these characteristics, it implies that we've found the mean variance frontier. But I, th I thought it would be helpful and uh, for readers probably if you could separate more um, this uh, assumption that uh, risk premium are linear and characteristics from, from the analysis, make it clear that the analysis doesn't matter. Yeah, you know, some very interesting results on the um, you know, understanding of covariance matrix, which are quite uh, you know, independent in principle from the assumption about uh, the means. Um, though it's, obviously it's a combination of the two things that gives the paper power. So I, I, I learned a lot from reading the paper. I think it's a very nice perspective on some different uh, issues. It's a sort of um, um, unifying principle, I think, uh, that's, uh, that, you know, that, that everybody should, um, should learn. Um, so I think it's a really nice contribution. All right. Well, Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, um, well, Sarah, do you want to respond to Carrie's discussion? Uh, well, no, I would like to uh, thank Carrie. Thanks. Thanks so much for the discussion. Um, uh, helpful and uh, a very nice discussion. Um, I, I don't have much to respond. I agree. Um, I think, yeah, with respect to linearity, um, we don't really use that assumption much. It's just that it helps us to put things to, to to formalize how to construct the factors. If you assume linearity, then some things are a little bit easier to explain in the paper. But the way I think about uh, X really is um, any characteristics, potentially any nonlinear transformation in characteristics, they are just like already in X. So if you have some uh, some model uh, neural networks or trees or something, and they just give us what the characteristic should be these nonlinear transformations. That's basically what we use in the framework. But uh, but it it might be helpful to think a little bit more about separating it and explaining it a little bit better in the paper. I agree. Um, I think Marcus might have a question. Uh, great presentation, great discussion. Thank you very much. Um, 
I have one expositional comment and I gave you that comment before. I think the notation can be optimized further. There are I don't, I don't like the whole alphabet in yeah. a way that's not very intuitive, but <laughs> I'm sure that's an easy point to address. Um, second point, I mean, the discussion of linearity, non-linearity, I understand you can always make the claim um, you, you, you can use nonlinear transformations and then you run an OLS regression, but I guess there's a reason why you have non-parametric methods and they're not just linear regressions in a trivial way. I mean, all the work is in finding the right nonlinear transformations and in practice, obviously that makes a big difference. And one reason why I want to mention it is because you can actually use the objective function of getting a high sharp ratio to find these nonlinear transformations. So I think you, the problem is not completely separate, right? I mean, once you know them, you're done, but I guess you need to use this objective of maximizing sharp ratios to find the right transformations. So it mixes things a little bit. Um, my more substantive some point with more substance is about, you need some kind of criterion to find. So my understanding is it's a lot about finding a low rank model for the covariance of characteristics and linking it to the covariance matrix of returns. I think that's really at the core. That's my take or one of the takeaways of the paper. And then there's a the question, obviously, how do you find this low rank or low dimensional representation? And then it matters what kind of objective function you use. And I think just to give you my point, uh, so one idea here, the characteristics are usually user defined. It's not like that they're necessarily chosen in a very good way, but you know, a user might use 100 times a variation of one characteristic and then add another one. So in this set of characteristics, the second characteristic has a, only a small representation, let's say is orthogonal to the rest. And any type of PCA method would never pick the second characteristic, but just would take some weighted average of the redundant first characteristic, right? And somehow, um, I mean, I understand your point is about when does the SDF based on um, characteristic managed factor is the same as if you would use all the stocks, but from an um, investment perspective, I care about, I mean, if I leave out this one second characteristic that is very small in terms of variation, because that's the way how I selected my characteristics in the first place, this should hurt me a lot. So I'm just wondering if there shouldn't be some kind of criterion in the selection of the low rank model that relates to the mean returns in some way, if it makes sense. But this is a minor point. I think your paper is great, just to make it clear. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, well, thanks. Thanks a lot. Uh, I, I agree with you. Like, okay, so three points. Notation, uh, I agree with you. It could be better. Um, Nonlinearities, uh, I also agree with you. They are interesting. And um, I think it's interesting to think of them as a part of the same objective to actually guide the methods, nonlinear methods to find a good representation. Uh, we don't want to include it in this paper. The paper is already pretty big and we kind of view it as a slightly separate thing, but it would be like a really nice extension probably to, to have or have a, like a separate paper that within this framework also puts some nonlinear methods and actually use uh, the, the, the framework and the restrictions to, to find that representation uh, mapping from characteristics to like some nonlinear function of characteristics. Um, the last point, uh, I... I agree. So right now, so we make assumptions very upfront uh, in uh, our dimensionality reduction. We just assume that means and covariances, like that Q matrix enters means and covariances in this way. And uh, under those rigid assumptions that we make, it's enough just to do PCA um, to, to get that Q. And I agree with you. Uh, if you think about some violations of the assumption, so if you think about that, there will be some um, components of characteristics that are really important for means and not so important for covariances, we would be missing it. So having some sort of objective that has both of these inside um, um, is interesting. Um, and yeah, we should we should think about that too, I think. Yeah, I agree. Um, I think Baird is asking an important question is, the paper doesn't seem to be available on SSRN yet. Do you, do you know when you're going to circulate a draft? <laughs>
Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, we are up in the process of updating the MPRX right now. It's a little bit in a disarray, but it's getting there. So um, uh, I am very hopeful that we'll be able to do it very soon, like within weeks, hopefully. Um, so, yeah. Um, and I think there, there's another question, um, which is about iterative hedging. Uh, so, so Carl is asking, um, should that iterative hedging um, improves the performance and after some iteration, the change in performance trails off. Do you think there is some theorem that could tell us how the performance changes per, iter per iteration, how that develops over time? Like what's the asymptotic behavior? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. Uh, we haven't um, fully explored that in this, de this much detail yet. Um, Intuitively, the way we think about iterating hedging is sort of like an iterative way of estimating that sigma inverse matrix, or at least the components of that sigma inverse matrix that matter for our problem without actually having to estimate the entire matrix and inverting it. Um, so there might be some potential to have a result that um, as we continue this iterative hedging asymptotically, it converges to something like partially GLS estimator. And we, we, we talk a little bit about this, but we don't have any formal proofs or like fully developed uh, results on that front, but it's interesting. Well, thank you. Um, and and uh, thanks to everyone for, for coming. So I think we should issue a big round of virtual applause to the speakers. And um, to, to everyone who, who participated. So uh, before we enter the unrecorded part of, of our uh, webinar, I want to just uh, put a plug that our next webinar is going to be on uh, April uh, 28th. And uh, Jan Spies is going to present um, uh, an interesting paper on unpacking the black box regulating algorithmic decisions which I think is becoming uh, quite timely these days. And uh, even though it's not on the slide yet, but uh, Paul Goldsmith uh, Pinkham from Yale is gonna be the discussant. So uh, if you're interested, please stick around. We'll upgrade you all to panelists to have some more open unrecorded discussion. Thank you. <laughs>